everyone, thank you for joining me. My name is Carlos. Today we're going to be getting into a back session and uh, talking a little bit about the state of the diet and where we are on this bodybuilding journey. So, where are we on the journey with the lifting? With bodybuilding, there tends to be generally two phases, you know, building up, bulking, trying to get stronger, bigger, gaining weight, gaining muscle. And then there's another phase, which is the cutting which in which you try to lose as much body fat, preserve all the muscle that you can, get as lean as possible, and maintain your strength and your sanity while you're doing that. So we're in the phase of cutting. Now, I'm not competing. I don't compete. I don't get on the bodybuilding stage or anything like that. I do this for my own personal edification. And yes, you can be outside of categories. You don't have to be pigeonholed into a category to fulfill your dream or to be the best vision of what you to fulfill your vision of what is the best for you it says oh you're bodybuilding so boom instantly categories subcategories and then this is what you need to do oh no 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 that is binding that is retarding that is it's a way sure if you want to compete i don't want to compete why do you want to get jacked if you're not going to compete because you, you, you have, to, that's the barrier to entry, you see. If you're not going to compete, then you can't do these things. Well, that's such a bunch of hocus pocus. It's just lies. It's barriers to entry. It's, they bind people to certain categories and they impede the realization, the self-realization of personal goals. So, in my personal case, yeah, trying to get as lean as possible, doing it my way. What does that mean? Well, uh, I study, I analyze, and I see what is the best way to lose body fat and maintain muscle. Because for me, I don't want to spend years building muscle to go lose it on some extreme diet and, you know, just hurt myself, you know, starving myself, going to extremes and stuff. So I maintain very, very small deficits. Once you can become extremely disciplined, with your dietary intake, which means you know exactly what you eat every single day. You don't cheat, you don't eat snacks, you don't have a sandwich here, a cookie there. Nothing that is not absolutely within your program. Then the smallest of changes make the biggest uh, difference. This is uh, this was Dor Dorian Yates' uh, method. He said he was so precise with his diet day in, day out, year after year, Adding or subtracting one potato, listen to this, one potato would make a difference over time. Now, obviously, you can't do that if you're the type of person that every, you know, week or every two weeks you go out because you have a social obligation and then, you know, you have lasagna or whatever and you just, you're, you're not on the diet. <clears throat> you try to maintain your diet as, as best you can, but, you know, there's so many occasions where you blow it that, you can't maintain those small deficits. You can't. You have to go harder if you want to stay in a deficit. Now, for those of us who actually can do this, small deficits are better, much better. I don't get hungry as much. I do get hungry, but it's mostly just like the appetite because I'm eating a lot of food, eat a lot of protein, you know, two, two and a half pounds of cooked chicken, beef, or pork plus seven to eight eggs, two yolks, and my normal carb intake, which would be about 150 cooked grams of rice for three meals, 200 grams of potato for breakfast on my high carb days. And okay, so that's how it goes with the diet. Very slight deficits over time. And I keep an Excel sheet where I write down my daily fasted weight and I average it out over 15 days and since the 10th of January, we're now on the 13th of March, it has been dropping either two or three pounds every 15 days. It's slowing down now. The last uh, 15 days, it was uh, 1.9 pounds lost, which is fine. I mean, if I lose half a pound consistently every 15 days, that's fine. I'm in no hurry. I have no deadline. I have no worries and no hurries. I, I live this way. I am on a permanent journey 
So as long as the journey is progressing and it's better to progress, especially with the fat loss, progress slowly because, and that brings me to the training, you can train harder. If you're eating enough food, you're getting in enough, you can train very hard. And of course, the idea of muscle is to train as heavy and as hard as you can. I'm not even going to start with the philosophies of lightweight training, high reps, high volume. That's, it's just, that's not it. Every single top physique or bodybuilder trains as heavy as they can. Why? Because it is about the weight. It's different to lift 10 pounds than to lift 45 pounds than to lift 60 pounds. This should be so obvious. But some people get really hung up upon the super strict technique. And if you're not doing it absolutely strict, then it's not working. And of course, that's the biggest lie of all. Yesterday, I was watching a video of Guy Cisternino, a retired 212 competitor. And he's doing his uh, side delts like this, like super strict. And he's teaching people how to do that. And he says, yeah, you know, it's, uh, this, is, uh, how do you ha this is how you teach people. But, you know, and then he gets all embarrassed because when he was competing, he was training with Branch Warren. And when he had those coconut delts, he had to admit they were swinging the weights. They weren't swinging 30 pound and 20 pound weights. They were swinging 70 and 80 pound weights. Why? Because to, get, to be able to lift that much weight, you have to get in a little bit of body English and some momentum. Now, you put those videos out there and some purist or some, you know, somebody who was taught and has never really done the processes, that is bad form. What they don't understand is that that is the way to build the muscle. <laughs> That's how you build muscle, by overloading with massive weights. Of course, you can get injured. This is how it happens. You have to be very careful. But you have to tell the truth. The truth is, the heavier the weight, the better your muscle development, or the bigger the muscle development is going to be. Okay? So... You want to maintain heavy, heavy training at all times. Now, when you're dieting, with these slight deficits, you can train heavy or heavier or to a certain point. Now, if you're going aggressive on your diet, obviously, you're not going to be able to train the same way. You're going to be, you know, compromising your, your, uh, your ability to lift maximum weights. If you're a hack squat with six plates and you're at a 700 you know, calorie deficit doing cardio twice a day, you might tear a muscle with four or five plates. So you gotta really temper it. You gotta bring it down. You gotta be careful. So that is the reason why people who are on extreme diets can't train heavy. First, low glycogen, low energy, not able to train, more susceptible to injuries. The lower your body fat, the easier it is to get an injury. So again, best way to, to diet is to maintain very slight deficits. Takes me into today's workout, the back session. Went to a different gym today, and uh, there wasn't really a great selection of weights. The uh, dumbbells were very light, only up to 80 pounds, and I found a hammer strength um, machine room where I could do one arm at a time. So what did I do? I spent most of my workout on that machine. I did seven or eight sets on each side of my body, which would be 14 to 16 sets total. Because one set on one side, it's a set. You gotta rest for at least a minute before going to the next. And so I just worked that thing, went up a pyramid, one plate, two plates, three plates, and I topped out at four plates for a one arm row. Four plates is uh, 190 pounds or something for a one arm. Felt absolutely awesome. The angle of this machine, just hitting the back. I mean, it's like, I'm filming this like three days after the, the workout. My back is still, like, I'm looking at it in the mirror this morning, and it's like gnarling up. The, it's like one of the most effective workouts. Just grabbing the muscle, working it. Stretch, hold the stretch. It's loaded under, uh, under stretch, and then you pull maximum contraction, hold the contraction. And I was playing with that bugger. And I stayed with three plates for like six sets total. So I went up the pyramid, and then when I was coming back down, I stayed at three. And just 
worked it. Just worked it. Got it so much volume. Like my back, my back can handle quite a bit of volume. And since I didn't see any other, you know, like propitious machines to work on that day, I said, nah, screw it. I'm just going to work on this for a while. So that was great. And then from there, moved to the barbell row. Now the barbell row is very, very taxing. It's a very hard exercise and uh, very demanding if you're going to lift a significant amount of weight. I would not use the barbell row for isolation, like super strict, and then you're doing this slow type of movement. No, for me, the barbell row is all about power and back power. So, you know, I, I'm going to see how high I can take it. Maybe I can get up to 275 or 315. Started out with one plate. Did super strict, you know, to get the just because, put on two plates, and instantly I noticed like my lower back was a little bit pumped. I was a little bit fatigued from all that work on that one arm row. And so I just got off one set of like seven or eight reps with two plates. Eh, maintenance, move on. Nothing to see here. Went to the cable low row. Now here I did something different. The cable low row, always, you know, I bring it in low. That's what it's about. You extend your scapula and you bring it down into your lower belly. Now today, I'm doing this, which, you know, I, I never do. And if I see somebody doing that, I would say that is, you know, like that's not kosher. It's not proper form. But at this stage, just about anything you can do, you can make work for you. If you're advanced, you got muscle, you got some size, different angles, different line of attack. And I'm looking on the video and my upper back is like just really working. So most people want to get their lower lat insertion happening, get looked like the build up the lower lat. Nothing wrong with building up the upper back, the teres, the rhomboids, the traps, the mid traps. And to hit the low row a little bit higher, man, like just from the first rep, I noticed like, oh shit, this is, I'm doing this different today. And so I was bringing it higher. I was bringing it higher. And uh, you know, I think I might be including this uh, different angle for the next few sessions. And then from there, I went to the last movement, which was the one-arm row. So why waste time? It's only 80 pounds. I mean, I have a video where I do 200-pound dumbbells. You know, sure, it's a yank and pull from the floor as fast as possible. You're not doing, like, you're not doing this thing with 200 pounds. It's like, boom. Ooh, I got four reps. I got a video on the, you know, up. So 200 pounds is, uh, you know, that's a significant amount of weight for a look for a one arm row. But that was at a gym where they put together this stuff. I never went back to that gym ever again. And the heaviest I found so far is 105 pounds here in Bogota. And today was like 80 pounds. <sighs> okay, just get in some reps. Do some stretching. And that's what I did. Just let that thing hang there for a second and then stretch, hang, stretch, you know, just, um, and that was it. Finished off the workout with that. Four exercises, one, you know, major where I'm just working that bugger and uh, the other is just, you know, getting in some more work volume. Three days later as I'm filming this, my back is still pumped. I mean, it's of course not like when you're at the gym, but. I can feel every single muscle in my back. Ah, oh, man, it's tight. It's getting big. And, uh, you know, I just can't wait to go do it again. <laughs> That's all I can say. I cannot wait and go and do that workout again. Just come working this shit. Working it. It's, it's enjoyable. It's one of the, you know, it's a lot of fun. So, anyways, that was the workout. The training philosophy for the cut. You know, four plates is still pretty heavy. It could have gone for five. The thing is, on those machines, since you're sitting down, you have to kind of, like, uh, accommodate some kind of a balance on there. So it's the heavier it is, the harder it is to get proper leverage. If I could, you know, perfectly leverage the thing, I could probably get five, maybe even six plates on one, you know, one side. But I have to leave that for another day. Anyways, been rambling on a little bit. So, advice, advice, I mean, where are you on your journey? If you're beginning, 
you know, if you're just starting out, I would say, you know, stay consistent with it. Stay with your routines. Try to, you know, get as strong and as good as you can within the constraints of what you know. But you have to learn. You have to learn. If you want to progress in bodybuilding, it's all about knowledge. It is all about knowledge and nutrition. Man, I was looking at a photo of myself 10 years back. The, you know, memories from Facebook 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, I was doing 500-pound squats. I was doing 500-pound deadlifts. I was doing 300-pound bench presses, and I was training heavy on everything. And I had a gut. I had, you know, my face was different. I was just like fat. I was fat. Why? Because I was clueless about the diet. Now, of course, you know about diets, sure, you know, but it's like truly, if you don't actually know, know, know about calories, macros, and if you haven't done this for several, you know, cycles, you're clueless. So I'm looking back at myself and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm horrified. I said, man, and I thank God that somehow his light reached me to save me from that. And I said, oh my God, I was on a path to, you know, being unhealthy, eventually I was drinking beer back then. I was eating unrestricted amounts of food. I would have no problem drinking half a gallon of chocolate milk and wailing away two or three cheeseburgers. I mean, I was, you know, the more food, the better. I just want to get bulky and big. And, of course, that's not the way to go. <clears throat> it is not the way to go. So, uh, my advice, once you want to get serious about getting better and about getting good, it is... 90% nutrition. If you know how to train, you go hard at the gym. It's like the biggest change you can make to your body, like right now. I'm not talking about, you know, anabolic steroids. I'm not talking about a different training technique. It's limiting your freaking calories, eating higher protein and modifying your carbs and your fats. Like really knowing how to do that. You're going to change your body like in two, three weeks. It's like you're going to look at yourself and say, man, of course it's all about the nutrition. If you stop eating for three days, you're going to see radical changes because food and hydration are the most powerful agents of change for the body. It's the quickest and most powerful uh, modifier that you can introduce into your life is food. Now, most people don't see these results because they, actually do, they don't actually implement those changes drastically enough to see any changes. I mean, again, taking things to extreme, stop eating for a week. You You'll disappear, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll go away. <laughs> so why? Because food, you need food every single day. So if you really control your intake, like, I mean, if you radically control your intake and make it the proper nutrition, you will see changes so fast, it'll make your head spin. The cost of doing that is self-control. And this is where the whole metaphysics of bodybuilding comes in. And I'll cite... You know, the Bible says it is, the person who has self-control is better than a general who, who storms ten cities. And, of course, this is not just the Bible. It's like there's many parables in the, uh, in the ancient world. And, you know, it's, it's known that a person who has self-control, self-dominion, can achieve anything in life. And the person who doesn't is like a victim of everything. You can't control your appetite, so you drink. You know, I, I just, I, I need a drink. You know, I got to, you know, I just, I can't control myself. You know, I'm hungry at nine o'clock at night. And so after all day of being strict on your diet, you go and eat a box of donuts and a bag of chips and half a gallon of milk because you couldn't control it. You don't have self-dominion. You can't control yourself. You don't, you don't have that, that power. And so that, that lumps you in like with a mass of people that, that are kind of like the losers in life. Like they're, they're, they're not winning. A person who has no self-dominion or very little self-dominion cannot win at life because there are so many things that require sacrificing pleasure, sacrificing momentary gain for a bigger picture that if you don't have self-control, there's just no way that you're going to do it. And of course, so bodybuilding is like, it can be the epitome of virtue. Like, Temperance, patience, long suffering, self dominion, you know, love because you love an activity and you persist, you know, so you persevere, 
those are virtues. And of course, you can apply those virtues to everything else in life. And so it's not like the gospel of bodybuilding and you're going to be safe. No, it's an activity that is very edifying. And so it merits to apply, you know, all the virtues that you can. One last thing, I get kind of bemused when I hear somebody say, oh, he's retired from, I, I retired from bodybuilding. You know, I used to compete, and now I retired from bodybuilding. And, of course, in my mind, bodybuilding is not about competing. That's, that's a category. That's, a, that's a, a, a mindless type of thing that people have been maneuvered and pigeonholed into. So if they're not in that category, then they're not doing it. See what I'm trying to say? It's not that easy to understand, but you can, you can grasp it if you try. You're always a bodybuilder, bro, because if you're not building your body... No matter under what circumstances, you're letting it deteriorate. You should be a bodybuilder by nature until the day you die. I mean, but duh. Doesn't it make sense? No, but since it, the category is you have to compete to be a bodybuilder, then that immediately excludes you from bodybuilding if you're not competing. I.e., it sucks because you're going to be robbed of your potential because you should always be bodybuilding. <laughs> That's all I'm trying to say. You should always be trying to build your body. Always trying to get better at something in your body. Okay? That's it. Okay, guys and girls, thank you for joining me. I really enjoy sharing time and getting these uh, you know, notions and ideas and insights out there. Sharing my journey, I believe it is worthwhile because I am progressing. I'm progressing as I enter later stages in life. I'm going to put up those photos, man. I am younger, stronger, more full of energy than 15 years ago when I was 43. I'll be 60 next year. And I, it's like a Benjamin Button thing with me. I'm just getting like more hyped, younger, more enthused, more, more kind of youngish in my attitudes. It's like just everything is changing. You know, I don't... It's weird. It's weird. It's also very good not to follow the mass of people falling off that cliff at the edge. Just, whoa, oh, you know, I'm getting old, bye. Dude, I'm taking a different path. Sayonara, you know. I'm building myself. I'm living my life to the fullest. I'm doing everything I can to be contrarian, contrary, be argumentative, and be just absolutely adversarial to those type of mindsets that will not let you progress and get better. Okay, God bless you. Everybody out there who is listening to me, have a wonderful day. We'll see you in our next episode. Don't forget to subscribe, like the channel. God bless everybody. Bye. So today, back day at a different gym, and it's been a while since I've seen one of these uh, machines. This is also like a perfect machine for me for the back row, almost. Uh, I'll explain why in a little bit, but it is a very, very, very good machine to really hit the lats, hit the upper back, hit the entire, you know, back structure with, with good stretch, good crunch, good contraction, and obviously you can load as much weight as possible. I think you can get like six or seven plates on that, on that uh, rod over there. Um, I go up to four. Problem with going up so heavy is that um, you have to you know, find stability somehow when you're doing just one arm at a time. I don't really like doing these in tandem, so I, this is what I'm doing. Warming up with one plate, really focusing on the contraction, really trying to just mash the muscle right from the start. And this is one of those exercises that you dream like, okay, if I just do enough of these, you know, I'll get this huge gorilla, silver, silver back, gorilla back, you know. So, um, you know, I was taking full advantage of this. I think I did like uh, six sets on each side. Just really spent my time on this machine, doing lots of reps, focusing on the stretch, on the contraction. And I knew I was going to, you know, be hitting as much weight as I possibly could. So I was taking my sweet time here. Um, I don't usually train at like different gyms, but I went to my wife's gym today. She started at a new gym near our house. And so I wanted to spend some time with her there and, um, you know, show her some exercises and stuff. So I, this is what I did. You know, I basically just spent some time here. And here we're up to two plates. And again, um, some observations on this machine. I kind of like to lean back on it. 
uh, get a little, not so straight, like trying to lean back the upper back towards, you know, just like doing a hyper extension along with the crunch. I found my groove like later in the sets. Um, trying to keep your torso forward or just straight upright, in my opinion, is not the best way. When you arch your back and roll back and hyper extend a little bit, you get more contraction. Like I, I could feel my back just contracting a lot deeper when I would roll back a little bit. Here I'm still hung up on the strict form. I swear the the the, the form Nazis and the like the super strict technique is absolutely the most stifling thing for growth. Once you I mean of course when you when you learn or when you're gonna teach somebody who's never done weights before, you teach them in the absolute strictness and the in the most perfect form possible because that's just the way it's done right but after a certain point you got to find your own way and find the way that that hits your muscles the best and sometimes it's with body english and and putting on progressive overload sometimes it's doing a little bit of swinging not too much it just you have to find out for yourself and really the opinions of others are, are at this point meaningless as long as you're making your gains as long as you are progressing you know, of course, if you're not progressing and you're doing things wrong, of course you need advice and you need to be told, you know, to straighten out your, your technique and your form. But after a certain point, now here I feel like it's just nailing it perfect. Like I get the stretch in, can't stretch any further, and I bring it back with some force, with explosive force, and contract my scapula, bringing it down to my waist. It's like, man, I couldn't contract it any harder. And here we go for the four plates. And uh, it's feeling very uncomfortable to maintain stability on the seat. So that's what I mean by, by the stability. It's, it's hard to like really get a groove with a heavy weight. Like I could probably do like five plates on here, maybe even six, if I had a proper way of stabilizing myself. So here we bring it back down to three. And it was like I went, I went up and down the ladder today on this machine, you know, from one to four back to three. I think I spent some considerable time with the threes, with the three plates, which is, you know, because it was comfortable for the stability, uh, comfortable on the seat. And I am an enemy of comfort. Like, you know, okay, this is easy. This is comfort, you know, comfortable. I can do this, you know, from now on. And no, I mean, yeah, that's how you stop making gains because you get comfortable. You know, although the truth be told, you know, I haven't done this exercise in so long. My back is screaming today. This I'm narrating this two days after the workout. My back is still, like, just pumped. Uh, absolutely, you know. So when you find a machine that really works for you, stay some, you know, spend some time on it. You know, why just do one set? You know, I guess you could, you know, the high-intensity thing. But high-intensity doesn't really work for me because I can't get in, in enough volume in that one set. I need, like, more work. And so that's what I did here. You know, I did, like, just endless sets. Do some more. Do some more. And, of course, by this time, I'm really, really feeling the back pump, which is, you know, a lot of people complain that they don't connect with their lats, and uh, thank God I don't have that problem anymore. I would suggest, like for those people that out there that have problem connecting with the lats, after these exercises, go and grab onto something and just pull as hard as you can. I, you know, like in a static pull. So you know, you, you grab onto a beam or a bar or something and just close to the floor and just pull and stretch and then hold that position for as long as you can and then you know, like for 30, 40 seconds, and then go do your set. I mean, really, it's, I think it's, anybody can really feel the, at least I, I think I can train anybody to just really connect with their lats. All you need sometimes is more volume, different angles, some different techniques. And here we went to the bent over barbell row, which is, when I go heavy on these, because I go up to three plates, it's usually the first exercise. So after doing 14 sets uh, on the machine rows, I come over here and uh, because there, it was kind of limited. This gym didn't have that was the only back machine worth mentioning. Sure, there were some pull down apparatuses, but that's like fluffy fluff and puff cables. I'm not really that big on those. So here, doing the uh, two plate barbell rows, and quickly I realized I was not going to be able to go up to three plates today. Getting in plenty of body English. Nonetheless, the back is being worked. 
felt good. So here, did some cable, some low row. It was, it was the, uh, among all the cable, like, rowing exercises, this is probably, for me, uh, my most, the one I get the most um, benefit from, more than just pull downs. So I worked this for a little bit. I think I did two or three sets here. And um, I was getting a decent pop. Now here I usually go very low. I try to bring it down to my groin or my navel. Then I switched it up a little bit, bringing it up higher to the chest. And obviously if you bring it higher to the chest, you're going to work more your shoulder girdle and your, your, your upper back, your muscles in your upper back, which are great for, you know, you got to develop those also. And here we finish with the one-arm dumbbells. Maximum weight in this gym, 80 pounds. Oh, my God. It's sad. It really is sad. Like, you know, I can do 150s with these. And with these these gyms here, you know, it's like one has a 105-pound dumbbell, and now it's down to 80 in this other gym. What am I going to be ending up with, like, little pink 5-pound uh, dumbbells? Come on, give me a break. Give me some real iron. Anyway, so I tried to do, like, lots of reps here. And, of course, after all the other exercises, this was a great finisher. Anyways, that was it for the back workout. Um, you know, that, that's basically it, guys. <laughs> Anyways, God bless you all. Really love you. Thanks for joining me on this journey. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And we'll see you all in the next video.